Uh, hello, uh, today we'll talk about a very interesting uh, Mexican architect, Juan O'Gorman, 1905-1982. Uh, let's read a little bit about him. Juan O'Gorman, born on July 6, 1905, died in January 17, 1982, was an American painter, as a Mexican, sorry, a Mexican painter and architect. Uh, here is uh, an appraisal, so to speak, uh, uh, critical appraisal. Um, O'Gorman was the most modernist of modernist architects. Under the auspices of the Mexican Revolution, he proposed a truly social and functionalist architecture he called the engineering of buildings, in which he took to extremes the principle of minimum cost and maximum efficiency. The result was an architecture of sparsity, cubic volumes with exposed concrete slabs and columns, brick walls rendered and painted in cheap and popular colors, large window openings that were divided into smaller inexpensive panes. O'Gorman made no concessions. Strangely enough, this crusade began in exclusive St. Angel, his own neighborhood. The client was his father for whom, aged just 24, he built Mexico's first modernist house opposite a magnificent 17th century hacienda, hacienda. The project didn't make much of an impact, except that the neighbors demanded that his architecture degree be revoked. Amusing. The house manifesto that followed was for his friends, very important painters, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, conspirators in rebellion and figureheads of the Mexican cultural scene. With Rivera's support, the architect received the necessary impetus for his cause. Beautiful, because I think we need architects and artists who are militant and who are indeed um, provocative and who together exclaim epate la bourgeoisie. Let's move forward. This was the man in a self-portrait. He painted a lot. I don't include in this presentation paintings, but I should have, and I apologize. Juan O'Gorman, Ideology and Philosophy. Well, smoking a cigar like uh, many uh, so-called influential architects. Here he is, uh, I imagine, with his wife, with uh, one of his two wives. Well, he didn't have two wives at the same time, of course. Uh, now, St. Angel, St. Angel, I don't know if I pronounce well, I guess, houses, one for his father and then for Diego Rivera and uh, Frida Kahlo. In 1929, O'Gorman purchased a lot containing two tennis courts in Mexico City, St. Angel, Colonia. On the plot, O'Gorman constructed a small house and studio intended for use by his father, now known as the Cecil O'Gorman House. The building's forms were strongly influenced by the work of Le Corbusier, whose theories of architecture O'Gorman studied. O'Gorman dubbed the house the first functionalist structure in Latin America. Diego Rivera, a contemporary of O'Gorman, impressed with the design of the Cecil O'Gorman house, commissioned the architect to design a home for him and Frida Kahlo on an adjacent plot. The house was built in a similar functionalist style from 1931 to 1932. So just, you know, two or three years after Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was built. The Rivera Calo house was two houses connected by a bridge. Both houses were purchased to be restored and opened to the public with the Rivera Calo house operating as a museum. Now we begin with the house he built for his father, the Cecil O'Gorman house, and I understood he was 24 when he built it. And it's a fine modernist house and different from the modernism of Europe, maybe because of the climate, of the specific nature, um, you know, plants, uh, trees of, uh, of, uh, of Mexico. A very fine building uh, and um, Perhaps some kind of a comparison could be made between O'Gorman and uh, you know, certain uh, European uh, modernists. O'Gorman was not afraid of color, quite the opposite. He employed color 
uh, you know, abundantly beyond the fact that he also painted. Um, but the inspiration coming from Le Corbusier is obvious. Uh, maybe not so much in this work, in, uh, in, in the works he built for Frida Kahlo and uh, Diego Rivera. So this is the house he built for his father, Cecil o. Gorman. And you see on the right, the blue buildings are those built for Frida Kahlo and uh, uh, Diego Rivera. I like the fact that the Mexican uh, uh, modernism uh, was, was also militant for a new social order. So there was an idealism which was not just aesthetical, but also political, social. And uh, I think architects should become militant as well. Of course, the orthodox uh, you know, uh, mentality would protest that the house doesn't have a parapet, but it is more uh, more enticing like this, maybe because it is more dangerous. Uh, you see here on the right, one of the two houses uh, built for uh, Frida Kahlo and uh, Diego Rivera. The interior, you see, the first ramp of the of the of the stair doesn't have a parapet at all, and uh, I guess uh, the author assumed that even if you fall from there, you don't fall from far away, and and uh, you know it's not so dangerous. And yes, sometimes the parapet uh, as an expression uh, expression of the parapernalia of protection, as Rem Kolhas calls it. Uh, reduces a little bit the visual impact of a stair. So this is the house built for his father when he was very young, like 24. And later on, a few years later, he built for Frida Kahlo and uh, Diego Rivera, and we are going to see the, the interesting also this fence done with, I cannot say built, made or done with the cactuses. Now the two houses for Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, here they are, reminding one of the works of Le Corbusier, but still a little bit different. Also the colors are uh, a little different from the colors employed by uh, Le Corbusier when he did employ them. Not bad. There are touches here also of uh, Russian constructivism somehow. So yes, it is a uh, convincing modernism, even by today's standards. So these two buildings united by a bridge at the top, you can see it behind the, the foliage of the tree. Uh, we're, done, we're built for uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Very important seminal figures of Mexican culture and world culture, in fact. In a strange way, perhaps the modernism of these houses is more uh, fresh than uh, the modernism of our time. Juan O'Gorman. Building for two great artists. Uh, he himself was an artist and uh, we'll see a, a house that he built for himself, which was demolished, unfortunately, quite, quite remarkable and quite, quite surprising. In fact, the very opposite of what we look at here. Very interesting transformation or metamorphosis that uh, Juan O'Gorman uh, went through. He also built some schools. In fact, I understood a number, a large number of schools in 1932. This person, then Secretary of Education, appointed O'Gorman to the position of head of architectural office of the Ministry of Public Education, where he went on to design and build 26 elementary schools in Mexico City. 
The schools were built with a philosophy of eliminating all architectural style and executing constructions technically. In a way, some kind of a ground zero architecture. After six years of functionalist projects, O'Gorman turned away from strict functionalism later in life and worked to develop an organic architecture combining the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright with traditional Mexican constructions. Las Escuelas de Juan uh, uh, O'Gorman, I just found a few images, but uh, you know, for the sake of information, maybe it's important to, to, to show them. A project for a school, uh, another school that was uh, realized, I, I read that uh, the price paid the cost of construction for all these 25, 25 houses was equal to the price of constructing so-called uh, traditionally or, uh, you know, in a more conventional way, one single school. So this was the functionalist period in the creativity of uh, Juan O'Gorman. But we'll see now also the wild organicism that he promoted later in life. An incredible transformation, Escuela Primaria, a primary school. And this is a website where you can uh, uh, see, you know, the, the schools that I chose to, uh, you know, uh, uh, adorn, so to speak, this presentation with a few images from. Anahuacali, 1942, a very interesting and provocative and unexpected work. Uh, in 1943, the artist Diego, Diego Rivera convinced the architect to help him build the Anahuacali, a studio house museum for his huge pre-Columbian art collection. It was conceived as a brutal stone mass in which diverse pre-Columbian styles mixed freely. With this building, Rivera wanted to show that a truly Mexican architecture was possible. O'Gorman's first stone mosaics appeared here, and from then on, they became the main feature of his architecture. This was the building, very different, of course, from the modernist functionalist buildings that he built uh, before. And I think without uh, actually being maybe very entitled uh, to, 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 to say so, it does have something of, uh, of, of the culture of, 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 that, uh, of, of Mexico. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing in a way that an architect who did just uh, some years earlier, those functionalist houses was able to build something like this very monumental, very powerful, very heavy. A good building, in my opinion, a very good building, symmetrical as it is, a fortress of the spirit, a fortress of art. Juan O'Gorman. Okay, so now we arrive at the last work I show today, a very important work, the Central Library at Ciudad Universitaria, Juan O'Gorman's most celebrated work due to its creativity, construction technique and dimensions, are the 4,000 square meters murals covering the four faces of the building of the Central Library at Ciudad Universitaria. These murals are mosaics made from millions of colored stones that he gathered all around Mexico in order to be able to obtain the different colors he needed. The north side pictures Mexico's pre-Hispanic Hispanic past and the south facade is colonial one, while the east wall depicts the contemporary world and the west shows the university and contemporary Mexico. From the beginning, I had the idea of making mosaics of colored stones in the walls of the collections with a technique in which I was already well experienced, he said, Juan O'Gorman. With these mosaics, the library would be different from the other buildings of Ciudad Universitaria, and it would be given a particular Mexican character. Um, 
I will uh, come back to, to it with many images, but now I just complete a short biographical note. In the later work, O'Gorman built and designed his own house in the suburb of Pedre Pedregal, which was part built structure, part natural cave, which is known as the Cave House from 1953 to 1956. It was decorated with mosaics throughout. It was demolished in 1969. Terrible. His paintings often treat in Mexican history, landscape and legends, a mural commission uh, resulted in the huge La Historia de Michoacan in the Biblioteca. Anyway, he painted the murals in the Independence Room in Mexico City's Chapultepec Castle and the huge murals in his, uh, on, of his own uh, central library, which we are going to see later. In 1959, together with fellow artists, and here are the names. O'Gorman founded the Militant Union, uh, Union, Union, Union de Pinots, Pintos, uh, Pintoresi y Grabadores de Mexico, Mexican Painters and Engravers Union. So again, he was, he was a militant spirit, very, very, very much engaged with the, with the city he was living in, with the country he was part of. Now the O'Gorman house from 1954, be, be, uh, please expect to see the unexpected. Architect Juan O'Gorman, uh, this was the architect and you see the house behind him, An incredible transformation, really. Uh, it was published in Hidden Architecture and this is a text by this uh, uh, person. Actually, I don't know if I should read it. Yes, let it be. Juan O'Gorman, Mexican architect, began, began his professional career with Le Corbusier and his towards an architecture, or more specifically, his very particular reading of the revolutionary text. This way, he builds the first functionalist house in Mexico, we saw it, followed by a series of schools characterized by nudity and frugality, unparalleled even in the same Le Corbusier-like proposal. Subsequently, and thanks to his relations with the National Revolutionary Intelligentsia, he put into practice his functionalist, functionalist proposal in the construction of some private houses, among which are those made for the painters Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in 1932, we saw them. However, after this functionalist effervescence of the 30s, O'Gorman completely disconnects from the architectural discipline to devote himself to his passion for mural painting. In the late 1940s, he began to explore new techniques in mural painting by introducing the use of polychrome mosaics made with stones extracted from different regions of the country. And I'll show now images from this formidable house, which was demolished, unbelievable. Unbelievable, because this is the dogma in the heads of people. You know, if, if they don't understand something and if something is in contradiction with their expectations, they demolish it. Even though he was a famous figure of the, of the intellectual and cultural uh, uh, ambiance of, of, of his time and place. But look at the house, you know, it's, it's a house which has absolutely nothing to do with the functionalist houses that he built uh, earlier. It's, uh, it's a house that uh, maybe Monsieur Cheval might have uh, built uh, if he lived in Mexico or maybe even in, in, in France. Um, it's a house that maybe Carl Jung would have admired. It's a house that explored the unconscious, the unconscious cave or the cave of the unconscious. Uh, it's a funambulesque uh, architectural statement made by this very complex and uh, contradictory, um, if I am to call him so, architect and artist. Can you imagine what the, you know, the mythical professor would say, seeing something like this? But it was not until the early 1950s that realism so promoted and defended as a true national identity by Rivera and O'Gorman would have been materialized in architecture. On a piece of land owned by Juan O'Gorman in the famous neighborhood of Pedregal, 
in the south of Mexico, the architect builds his own house. O'Gorman, avoiding any generalization, tries to particularize his proposal, creating not only a link, but a true fusion with a place, or even more, an immersion of the same land. The result was practically an almost natural cave that remembers some Mannerist Italian constructions of the 16th century. Even in the very definition of the most important space of the construction, that is to say the room, was kept a formal relationship with the anti-academist anti architecture. Its formal oval was an evocation of the rooms of the caves built in the gardens of Boboli in Florence by Il Tribolo four centuries before. Bravo to him. But we cannot say bravo to those who demolished it. That's Frida Kahlo there in the, in the, in the chair. A great painter. Juan O'Gorman. Either by the same suggestive form of the house or by the series of gardens that surrounded it, the house managed to become one with the landscape, notwithstanding the surprise to the visitor when it was first encountered in a kind of surrealistic objet trouvé. The choice of the cave as a model for the definition of the house can have different readings that more than contrast then that more than contrasts are complemented. This is not a great translation, I'm sorry. On the one hand, the archetype of the cave recalled the same origins of architecture, an almost unconscious form of returning to the essence of dwelling, that is to take shelter. On the other hand, the cave evoked directly or in, in, indirectly the maternal womb, an idea linked in some way to surrealist, surrealist thinking. And yes, his architecture was uh, in, in, in this phase of his uh, creativity um, connected uh, to uh, surrealism. So from functionalist to surrealist, this could be an interesting topic of discussion. The living room in the O'Gorman house, not bad. Nature and culture together for the fears and astonishment of the bourgeois. Was he depressed? Maybe because he committed suicide at 76, I think. This man very accomplished. Another work by Juan O'Gorman, The Library of Mexico, Mexico City, the, his most important work in terms of fame, here it is. And I think it's remarkable the way he combined, uh, you know, an almost international style of architecture to this uh, splendid uh, Mexican-ness, you know, the, based on the, on the murals that he created. The, those who combat, who, who oppose the presence of fine art in architecture should see in this example that when married, they could be very convincing. When, when married, uh, when married uh, uh, you know, uh, skillfully as he achieved. He was the architect together with two other architects, but he created the most interesting part of the, this library, the uh, full decoration of the four facades of the tall part of the building. I think it's a very powerful building and uh, I think we should reconsider uh, allegory, emblems, myth, color, decoration, ornament, uh, because I think uh, modern architecture in its uh, orthodox mode um, lift, its lift its life. We see here the sun and the moon, don't we? You know, and uh, 
there is there is so much richness on this blank wall, which if it was just blank, would have had no interest at all. Bravo to O'Gorman, Juan O'Gorman. It's a unique building. And these are mosaics. Because what is a library? Well, it's where you gain knowledge and the, the facades of the building uh, express the wholeness of knowledge, which is not static, it's dynamic, it's continuously in the process of, process of becoming. Juan O'Gorman. Thank you.